There are a few father-son comparisons in American Negro annals more worthy of study than that of Benjamin J. Davis, Jr. and Sr., the father, a leading Republican politician in Georgia, the son, the only member of the Communist Party ever to win an elective office in the United States, uh, at least as far as this researcher has found. Ben Sr. led a tortured life of political confusion. In the heyday of Booker T. Washington, he alternated between praise and blame for the Tuskegee conciliatory approach to politics. A deep believer in the viability of Negro business, he lived long enough to see it ruined in the Depression. Davis was the owner and editor of the strongly Republican Atlanta Independent. In the 1920s, he fought successfully to become National Republican Committeeman from Georgia and consequently suffered a Ku Klux Klan cross to be burned on his lawn, only to have Hoover jilt him and his efforts by purging him from his post as part of concessions to Lily White Republicans. His contribution to his son seems to have been to prove by case history that working within established American political parties was useless for the Negro. The elder Davis had worked hard to amass a sizable sum of money and much community prestige. He wished to have his son become a respected man of the upper echelon of the black bourgeoisie, and yet, out of some subliminal pride in his bricklayer origins, uh, Ben Sr. saw to it that his son tasted of the drudgery of work. The job selected for young Ben was not a very trying one. He was to be a chauffeur for Professor John Hope of Morehouse College. Uh, ben Sr. even helped Dr. Hope purchase the Dodge car which young Ben would drive. The future communist leader did not take readily to the task of playing the proletariat. He would leave the family estate in his Pierce Arrow, drive to Morehouse, and take Hope out in the Dodge. On one occasion, when a tire blew out, the young Ben jumped out of the car and started running. The startled Hope inquired, where are you going? To the drugstore to phone. What for? asked Hope to get someone to change that tire. Uh, you come back here and you fix that tire or you'll get fired, said Hope. So the future friend of Toiler's sweated underneath and around that 1920 car for two hours, getting all the while increasingly messy and mad. Meanwhile, Hope sat in the car, busy with his portfolio, silent and unencouraging. When the new tire was finally in place, Hope had the youth drive him to his destination, hardly saying a word. But later that evening, they met again, and Hope's face lit up with amusement as he placed a hand affectionately on the young man's shoulder, saying, uh, Now, Ben, you've had your first experience working for someone else. Ben Sr. carefully arranged a rigid educational background for his son. At the age of 11, he sent him to Morehouse, uh, as uh, was the practice of the time. A favored few Southern Negroes were taken out of regular school systems at a very young age and sent to special college preparatory sections of leading Afro colleges. Ben Jr. spent six years in Morehouse preparatory and one in college, after which he transferred to Amherst, where he graduated in 1925. He obtained a law degree from Harvard Law School in 1929. Collegiate years are, of course, educational in more than just an accumulation of semester units. And it is worth considering the effect on young Ben of his father's actions during the son's years in college. Exaggerated outbursts of rhetoric were a regular feature of Ben Sr.'s journalism and his newspaper, The Independent. While younger Davis was off at Amherst, his father made national news in the Negro press for an outspoken defense of the morals of Southern whites. The defense of the South was called forth as a reply to a Chicago Defender article on race mixing. Said an irate Davis, It is not true, as the Chicago Defender states, that the white men of the South defy and approach our women. But it is true that Negro men in the North mix with white women in the slums and dives. And white men of the North mix with Negro women of the slums and dives. And in each case, neither the Negro nor the white men are of the best mind and thought of the North. He concluded that race mixing was immoral. And this apology for the lectures of Debauch Dixie and the holier-than-thou good nigger better-than-bad nigger line 
drew sharp criticism from Northern Negroes. Undaunted, Davis wrote another column saying that, um, quote, the social mixing of white men and Negro women or of colored men and white women is practically unknown in the South, and white men in the South make no effort to take advantage of Negro women of the South, good or bad. Wherever such conduct obtains, and the cases are far and wide between, the Negro woman is as much or more responsible than the white man. The Pittsburgh Courier asked Davis from whence came all those light-skinned Negroes. Davis Sr. was a crusading Republican. In 1927, while his son is in college, he succeeded in his long battle to become na Negro national committeeman from Georgia. Um, to keep his post, he had to fight not only with the Klan, but also with Lily White Republicans. He offered as his best defense his loyalty to the party. In the election of 1928, he totally castigated a group of Georgian Negroes who formed an independent democratic alternative to the Republicans. Quote, we are not going to get out of the ship and into the sea, said Davis, drawing on the ancient argument of Frederick Douglass. And he went on to make clear that he was not implying there was nowhere else to go except to the Republicans. He was not being forced. Quote, we cannot be bought by Democratic money nor bulldozed by Lily White Republicans. Well, shortly after the election, he was in fact pushed out of his committeeman post by Lily White Republicans. The Lily White Republicans were the, that faction of the Republican Party wishing to set up a segregated white only Republican Party in the South. Um, just about anybody of importance uh, was fair game for an occasional vitriolic diatribe from the pen of Ben Davis Sr. In 1923, he damned Kelly Miller and William Monroe Trotter's sponsorship of the Sanhedrin, um, which was a uh, big confab uh, composed of uh, NAACP, Urban League, and a lot of notable Negro educators. According to Davis, Quote, it was the same, um, the same old gang who has misrepresented the race for 25 years, leaders who exploit the rank and file of their organizations. In Davis' picturesque description of the Sanhedrin, the members were clerks, demagogues, agitators, non-property holders, and professional self-styled leaders for bread and butter. With this background, young Ben entered uh, the field of law. This uh, background of his father's activities. Two years in the law field, uh, and he was a member of the Communist Party. In explaining how the son of a black aristocrat broke with tradition, Ben Jr. implied that he was merely having a spontaneous reaction to the oppression of his people. Quote, my impression of the communist was formed during the period of Scottsboro, a case which epitomized in all its horrible completeness the plight of the Negro and at the same time symbolized the zealously executed and correct policy of the Communist Party. The immediate cause for uh, joining communism was not Scottsboro, however, but his experience as a defense lawyer in the celebrated Angelo Herndon case of 1932-33. Quoting Ben again, Credit for recruiting me into the party goes to Judge Lee B. Wyatt, who had been summoned from the backwoods hinterland of the state to hear the case. So crude and viciously unconstitutional and anti-Negro were his rulings that my instant joining of the Communist Party was the only effective reply I could give. Although Herndon, his client, was convicted, Davis had made quite a name for himself in his rigorous defense, and his legal maneuvers laid the basis for a higher court decision overruling the conviction and setting Herndon free. Davis denounced the exclusion of Negroes from the jury rolls and the prejudicial use of anti-Negro language by the prosecutors, and the young defense attorney made much of the fact that Herndon was on trial under an obscure Georgia insurrection law, which was allegedly violated in passing out leaflets supporting communism. Davis retorted to this by drawing on obscure laws of his own, the civil rights laws of Reconstruction, 
uh, which had since been repealed. Um, this is civil rights laws of uh, the state of Georgia. And Davis argued that the repeal of these acts had been achieved by an unconstitutionally constituted racist government in Georgia. He declared the existing state constitution was illegal. Um, Herndon, in an account of the trial that uh, he wrote, uh, said, uh, quote, the judge glowered at the Negro attorney who dared challenge white justice but young Mr. Davis could not be put out of face by any display of white superiority. Unafraid and with the dignity of a man who knows his worth, he fought both judge and prosecutor with great energy. I was fortunate in having him for my lawyer. There was a sympathetic communication between us throughout the course of the trial which sustained our spirits in the general hostility against us. Shortly after the Herndon trial, Davis changed his place of residence from Georgia to New York. In 1935, he was named as editor of the New Harlem Weekly of the Communist Party, the Negro Liberator. Later, he would join the staff of the Daily Worker. His most noteworthy achievement was the winning of a seat on the New York City Council, a feat he pulled off in 1943 and again in 1945. In engaging in politics, Davis was far more than a party official. He skillfully built a system of ties and support among a wide variety of Harlem leftists and liberals and showed that uh, he had taken from his father far more than a striking physical resemblance. To the Harlem populace, young Davis was known as Fighting Ben, a defender of the race, which implied that he had retained the attempted personal integrity of his father while dispensing with the mental confusion which led the older Davis to alienate supporters almost as fast as he made them. During the 1940s, Davis was a respected community figure, and he might be found walking the streets of Harlem or on the tennis court with his sportsman friends. By the election of 1945, Davis was powerful enough to win the endorsement of two of the, th the three Harlem weeklies, the leftist People's Voice and the Republican New York Age. Terming him, quote, a brilliant and forceful councilman, the Age held that, on his record alone, Councilman Davis deserves re-election. Not even his most severe critic can ever accuse Mr. Davis of ever having espoused any cause in the city council except the cause of American democracy, which is more than can be said of some other councilman elected on major party tickets. Among the many non-communist leaders in the community endorsing him in 1945 were Dr. Channing Tobias of the National YMCA, Edward S. Lewis, head of the New York Urban League, and James E. Allen, president of the New York NAACP. Uh, early in the campaign, he even had the support of Tammany Hall, which was later withdrawn. However, on the eve of the election, it appeared that if Davis were to win, it would be solely on his community power, on his support among Negroes. The campaign in 1945 was not an easy one. The voting was on a citywide basis, with the top vote catchers winning council seats. Um, and white leftists, aside from the communist, were aligned solidly behind the mayoralty campaign of Democrat William O'Dwyer, who had strongly denounced Davis. The Liberal Party candidate, uh, Jonah De J. Goldstein, was making a strong bid for the mayor's position, and his party had run the only opposition candidate to Davis. Uh, the powerful A. Philip Randolph had worked hard in Harlem in behalf of the Liberal Party and had raised the red bogey against Davis. Uh, but when the votes were in, um, Davis had won a seat by 63,000 votes. As seen in this election, Davis relied on race support. In his approach to communism, he was an able advocate of the dual position of the party and stressing at one and the same time the need for Negro action and Negro unity, coupled with a conscientious attempt at coalitions with the working class whites. Writing in 1947, he argued, quote, the broadest unity of the Negro people's movement on a local and national scale is not only crucial, but is the deepest desire of the Negro people. Davis had in mind a unity of the NAACP, Urban League, National Negro Council, National Council of Negro Women, quote, the National 
Church Bodies and Faiths, the United Negro and Allied Veterans, the Fraternal and Greek Letter Groups, and above all, the Negro Workers. And what a powerful force the Negro people would have if such a grouping could be brought together, uh, uh, quote, on a minimal program to advance the free and equal citizenship of the Negro people. Davis never got the opportunity to try out this program. He might have been quite good at leading such a coalition. In his years as city councilman, he showed an ability to act above and beyond narrow Marxian revolutionary precepts. In fact, uh, extreme left-wing groups like Trotskyites felt Davis and the party were not acting Marxian in the slightest, but rather like milquetoast New Dealers. The whole question was made academic by the McCarthyite terror. In 1948, Davis was indicted under the Smith Act and charged with being an agent of a foreign power. The immediate effect was not nearly as calamitous as the long-term consequences. To his trial, Davis brought the fighting spirit of his past. He told the Foley Square Court, quote, I will not be intimidated by the lynchers court in Georgia, and I will not be intimidated by any court, by any forces of reaction anywhere, and neither will my people and my party. What the court could not do, jail accomplished. Davis was silenced. Meanwhile, a new breed of radicals emerged. The civil rights movement was born afresh, and new issues and coalitions were in the offing. Africa was nominally free. Then in 1961, Ben Davis was released from prison. He returned to Harlem once more to walk the streets to talk with the people. But no one was listening to communists. Malcolm X had the floor. And if not the black nationalists, then the young leaders of CORE and SNCC. Who was going to be interested in a fighting coalition of the NAACP and Urban League? And the party had done little in the way of revising its program since Davis was first arrested. Moreover, there was precious little time for Davis to get acclimatized to the weather signals of the new political tornado. On March 15, 1962, he was again picked up by federal police this time under the McCarran Act, and once again valuable time and energy was consumed in a legal defense, a successful one for whatever it was worth. Davis died in New York, August 22, 1964, at the age of 60. A personal friend remembers Ben Davis, Jr. for his many humorous stories about his conservative old man in Georgia. Ben Jr. had worked hard to avoid the pitfalls of mainstream political action, to avoid the narrowness of a bourgeois social philosophy, and yet he had inherited too much. He was outspoken, and he was black. <laughs>